the recent school strike for climate action as the um, oh sorry but the recent school strike for climate action as the ultimate intersectional political concern has inspired us to come together tonight to reveal the anarchy in the archive. The protest collection at Museum Victoria was officially established in the 1980s with the first social history department. However, there has been First Nations material in our collection since the, 19, since the 1870s. And in the face of the devastation that colonization has brought, their very existence is an act of resistance. So we have had protest always in our collections. The official collection, though, sits at around 1,300 objects in protest, including a large collection of badges and ephemera relating to public protests and demonstrations around significant international campaigns, such as the Vietnam War, women's rights, gay rights, and peace and anti-nuclear campaigns, and also encompasses the trade union collection of some 2,000 objects, including banners, badges, and certificates relating to the history of trade unions in Victoria, and the eight hour day movement. Today though, tonight, we have three short presentations of the most recent acquisitions under the banner of protest and resistance. Firstly, Kimberly Moulton, Senior Curator of Southeastern Aboriginal Collections in First Peoples Department, will share her recent acquisitions around identity and the politics of resistance. Followed by Michael Reason in the front row here, uh, curator of leisure and social spaces, who will share work around documenting the marriage equality campaign and the resulting collection. And then back to me um, about collecting at the first two climate strikes um, last year and this year, earlier this year. And we will close the evening with a Q&A session with the curators um, who are also privileged to be joined tonight by Wiradjuri woman and House of Dizzy owner, Christy Dickinson, who's down the front, hi. Um, and also, um, we are really fortunate to be joined tonight by uh, Milu and Harriet, all the way from Castlemaine. Where are you sitting? Ah, they're down the front. Um, who were two of the uh, first campaigners, uh, strikers in the country who ran a campaign in Bendigo, which eventually led to the first national strike. Um, so now I'll hand over to Kimberly. Thank you. Um, so as Beck has mentioned, um, my name's Kimberly, Senior Curator of South Eastern Collections. Um, I'm a Yorta Yorta woman and uh, I grew up in Shepparton, country Victoria, but I've been up here for about 15 years now. Um, so I would like to acknowledge um, the lands of the Bunwurrung and the Woiwurrung. Um, I'm a guest on their country as well. Um, so tonight I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the South Eastern Collection um, and a few contemporary um, new acquisitions that we have just recently brought into the collection, but also some of our um, older historical collections um, dating back to around 1888 that I see sitting within the space of protest uh, and resistance as well. Um, let's work this. There we go. Um, so the South Eastern Collection at Museums Victoria has around 4,000 objects in it and Within that, there's about 60% that are from Victoria. Um, many of them are um, from the 19th century, so we have lots of beautiful shields and spears and clubs and, and lots of beautiful um, cultural materials made by our ancestors um, from that time. Um, but we also have a range of, of beautiful baskets and, and more contemporary things. Um, and one of the big gaps in the Southeastern Collection, so part of my role as a curator is to, to acquire, to research, to look at the collection, care for it, but also address what's missing in that collection. Uh, and we have a bit of a gap from the 60s onwards, really. Um, so that's part of my role now is to kind of look at that and, and see how we can um, fix that. So tonight I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, these objects through the context of social justice, 
um, through artists responding um, to events in our history um, and to the collection, um, and also cultural practice and revival. Um, and I should actually make mention. So these are two um, really exciting new acquisitions. Um, one from Christy from House of Dizzy, um, and we've got a few of her um, beautiful earrings coming into the collection that are speaking very strongly to intersectional feminism, to identity, to um, respecting um, black women and, and matriarchy. Um, and Tani Edwards also from Gam and Threads um, speaking to similar themes. Uh, and this is also really important to me um, and to the collection here because women and Aboriginal women um, are not as strongly represented in our collection. So that's something also I'm addressing and really um, proud to have these deadly um, strong black women in our collection now. Um, and Mark is going to talk a little bit more about House of Dizzy, I think, afterwards. Um, and then in between that is actually a basket by Auntie Jemima Wandon, who is a Wurundjeri, was a Wurundjeri woman. Um, and we have her baskets and beautiful images in the collection and her um, descendants are still weaving today. So there's this beautiful um, conversation happening between the ancestors in this collection and then these um, you know, c contemporary artists that are uh, in the collection as well. So looking at um, social justice in our collection and these two images, um, the one on the left is actually from Aapsis, it's not from our collection, but the image on um, your right here of um, William Cooper and others are from the Museum's Victoria Collection. And actually, I'm just going to put this here as a little thing. Because um, Uncle William Cooper is my great uncle. He's my great grandmother's brother. Um, and he was, uh, well, he is very instrumental in my life. Um, and as his grandson is, my uncle Boydie. But William Cooper was um, an activist and he started um, Australia, one of Australia's first Aboriginal political groups in 1932, the Australian Aborigines League. So in 1988, Australians celebrated the bicentenary of Australia. Um, the, celebra the celebrations began on New Year's Day with the first fleet reenactment and a voyage that sailed into Sydney Harbour. Over two million lining the shore to watch what may consider a whitewashed reenactment of the commencement of occupation. Just 50 years prior, in 1938, a day of mourning was declared by William Cooper, who, as I said, started the Australian Aborigines League. Um, and this also had key political figures, included um, Annie Marge Tucker, Margaret Tucker, people like Eric Onus and Shadrach James. Um, and they were members of this political group. So in, in 1938, they called a day of mourning and the Aborigines Progressive Association of New South Wales, which was established by Jack Patton and William Ferguson, they marched with over 100 people in silent protest on this day. They ended the march with a meeting um, of community where people rallied together to demand better treatment of the first peoples of this country. This resolution, and this resolution was developed, I'll read out, but so we're, you know, back at, in 1988 and Australia is celebrating, reenacting the First Fleet. Um, this is all happening, but then if you rewind back to um, 1938, this huge movement of, of politics was happening with our communities. Um, and the resolution that was read out after this silent protest, um, which they had to also wait for that, um, for the... Um, the march to stop, um, celebrating that time, um, and they walked behind that, and then they had to enter the building that they were having their meeting in from the back. Um, and they read this resolution that says, and this is also the language of the time, we, representing the Aborigines of Australia, assembled in conference at the Australian Hall, Sydney, on the 26th day of January, 1938, this being the 150th anniversary of the white man's seizure of our country hereby make protest against the callous treatment of our people by the white man during the past 150 years. And we appeal to the Australian nation of today to make new laws for the education and care of Aborigines. 
We ask for a new policy which will raise our people to full citizen status and equality within the community. So fast forward back to 1988, and many of the non-Indigenous majorities still fail to see any disrespect in celebrating an occasion made possible by the murder, massacre, dispossession, slavery, and attempted genocide of Ab Aboriginal people. Stickers and banners and posters were made of this time, and the, the NAIDOC theme um, was this. Since their arrival, we've fought for survival. And the day of mourning actually um, sort of became, um, for us, NAIDOC week. So it's Ge NAIDOC week's genesis actually came out of the day of mourning in 1938. Um, so this protest, it was ultimately about unity. It was Aboriginal people coming together with non-Aboriginal people. Um, to protest, this is eight, um, 1988, to protest um, with the bis you know, bicentennial celebrations happening. And there was over 40,000 people coming together in Sydney to march. So this was a um, momentous occasion and it was actually the largest protest since Viet the Vietnam moratorium. And in our collection we have um, you know, some of this material, stickers, we have um, a, a badge from this year um, have I blocked something? <laughs> um, you know, so that speaks to this, this time and this really important time in, in Australia's history and the Aboriginal community's history um, in actually standing up in unity and saying white Australia has a black history. So we've also looking um, at social justice and as I was talking about before with um, Tani's work, and her, her design business is called um, Gammon Threads. And it's actually looking at contemporary life and identity. And um, there's a lot of people, um, I own several of her T-shirts, but there's a lot of community that are wearing these T-shirts and, and being really proud about identity um, and matriarchy. Um, and it's through the work of Tani and, and others um, in this space that this is actually really visible now out in community. And so I felt that it was really important to include and, and in talking with Tani, include this in the Museum's Victoria collection in representing you know, what's really current for us as a community today. Um, and her work always also talks to sort of social aspects of the home, like um, Keen's curry powder is a curry sausages is a very big <laughs> thing in Aboriginal communities. I'm sure a lot of you grew up with Keen's. Um, but you know, it's speaking to these really relevant um, things for us in community today. Um, in terms of artist response, how am I going for time? Five minutes. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a, an acquisition that's not recent within the last couple of years. This was actually 2015 um, that we acquired this, but it speaks to the colonial histories in our collection and of our country. And um, breastplates were a... Um, also known as king plates. Um, and there were hundreds given out in the colony to Aboriginal people. Uh, they were inscribed with names of king or chief, and in some instances, queen. Um, and they were presented to individuals identified as key leaders or negotiators at the time of settlers um, by the colonial administrators. But today, you know, breastplates are considered as symbolic of the dispossession and disempowerment of Aboriginal people. Um, in the 19th century, but it continued right until the 1950s. Um, and they represent, you know, that colonial authority. And so we had an exhibition a few years ago working with the Picture Making Fellows, which is actually a collective of Aboriginal men um, based in Ballarat. And they decided to do a, a work um, called The Honour Roll, and they produced a series of their own breastplates um, that were sort of, I guess, tongue-in-cheek um, and looking at our sort of current political climate and at the time, and it's ongoing um, in terms of the boats and stop the boats and, and everything that was happening with that and Tony Abbott was um, in power and so one of the breastplates that came out, um, you can see up here. So they were, you know, making these political statements um, on breastplates that were actually used um, historically as something to control our people. Uh, and I thought it was a, just a really powerful statement <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and speaks very strongly to the museum's Victoria collections because we have quite a significant collection of historical um, breastplates like you can see up here. 
So the most recent um, acquisition is uh, an image by Hayley Miller Baker. And um, Hayley is a good at Jamara woman, uh, an amazing um, young artist and photographer. And she does these beautiful photo collages. And this is from a series called um, A Series of Unwarranted Events. And this is actually looking at a massacre site um, on her country, on Gunit Chamara country, um, which is called the Convincing Ground. And she um, put together this, this photo collage um, that speaks to this history of the Convincing Ground where um, the Kilkare Gunditch clan um, were massacred um, in the mid 1800s. Um, and, you know, this is a really important work when we are referencing and looking at these colonial um, frontier histories in our collection. And that's something that I'm more inter I'm interested in now in terms of how our community today and our living artists um, are working with these themes. Um, and, you know, I hope to eventually work with my colleagues um, in society and technology on some of the colonial objects that we have in the collection um, that actually come from the fam family, the Henty family, that committed uh, this massacre. So we have a clock um, from the family. We have Richmond Henty's crib um, in the collection. He was the first white child born in Victoria around the 1835 or 36. White boy. White boy. White boy. Um, you know, so really loaded colonial objects in terms of a First Peoples perspective. So having works like this that Haley's produced, we can have these conversations through our objects um, and actually kind of bring these to light a little bit more. Um, and quickly, um, also looking at the collection through the lens of um, resistance and cultural practice. So we have, um, we're very lucky to have a William Barak painting and the NGV have many as well. Um, and we have these beautiful images of William Barak who was a Narangita, a chief of the Wurundjeri people of Melbourne. And William at a time where people were being placed onto missions, you know, we weren't able to practice our culture. Our ceremonies um, were forcibly being stopped. He was painting them and illustrating them and um, the, the colonisers at the time were even buying them and hanging them on, on their walls, um, which I think is a really interesting space. Um, so in terms of looking at the, you know, in that portal of history and how these ancestors were not only recording our stories and these ceremonies, but I, I see them as an act of resistance. Um, so finally, I'm going to quick... So we've got also contemporary works happening. So uh, Marie Clark is an amazing uh, Victorian Aboriginal artist and she's worked with our collection, with the historic collection of kangaroo teeth necklaces and her and Uncle Len Chugoning have um, a, a while ago now made new ones. So how does uh, cultural revival work within this space of protest as well, which is something that we're really interested in um, and furthering that within the collection. But I'm gonna wrap it up now. Um, and we can discuss a little bit more on stage later. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Reason. I'm curator here at the museum and I'll be talking to today about the uh, marriage equality collection that we've built up um, over the last couple of years. Um, and I've called it a stamp of approval. Australia says yes, and uh, to do with the new stamps that have come out, and it shows the amazing um, leap that's been made in two years. Um, uh, the fact that we've gone from you know not knowing what was going to happen to being on you know letters going across Australia. Um, I'll just go quickly go through the uh, marriage equality movement. Um, it started in 2001 uh, in Netherlands. That was the first country to to legalise uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, then it went through a number of countries, uh, Belgium, Spain, Canada, South Africa, Norway, Sweden, Portugal, Iceland, Argentina, Denmark, etc., etc. Uh, Brazil then became the first country to use the courts to change the law. And then in 2015, Ireland was the first country to um, have, it, have it changed by popular vote. So while all this was happening, John Howard thought, mm, I better do something to stop this, this, uh, this rot that's going through the world. So he changed the marriage law in 2004 uh, to include the words uh, marriage means the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others. 
So this, of course, meant it was a little bit more difficult for us to change things. So in 2017, the, the Parliament decided to uh, have a plebiscite, um, or as it officially was called, the Australian Marriage Law Postal Survey, something that uh, could have been avoided, but, uh, but there you go, it, it happened. It cost $80 million, and it went from the 12th of September to the 7th of November, with the results to be um, announced on the 15th of November. Now, we decided that we would do something to, to um, sort of commemorate this, to, to um, show our support for it. So we um, decided to collect material, and we also decided to have an uh, exhibition at the Immigration Museum. And this is part of the Immigration Museum thinking about expanding itself to look at sort of issues of contemporary identity. Um, so anyway, so I was put onto the project. Uh, unfortunately, I was also on another project at, the, at that time, an exhibition called You Can't Do That. So I was pretty much on that full time and trying to collect this material and trying to work on this exhibition. So I, ha I thought, well, how can I do this? Because, I mean, you can write to people, but of course they're all running around trying to organise things for the plebiscite to, to, you know, to promote yes, no. So I thought, well, I have to make it try and make it uh, manageable. The, the current collection didn't have that much in it. This is some material from an earlier rally in 2012. Uh, but we didn't have much of a collection to build on. So uh, I decided, uh, of course, you need, a, uh, you need one of the survey forms. And the easiest way to do that was to no donate my own one and actually request a, another one saying it had been lost. So, <laughs> uh, so that was easy. So, we, of course, we had one of those. Uh, I then decided um, this to, to use the local area was the best way of collecting things. So um, I used Her Here's and Ienas, the bookshop in Johnson Street, the office of Ad Adam Bant, and... Uh, also Melbourne University and a few other places. So I had places I could go to. I knew I could collect material. Uh, so Adam Band, of course, had uh, material to do with the Greens campaign. Um, and if you look at them, a lot of them are very, very visual, but also very practical. They're telling you how, how to make your vote count. So, um, and same with that one. Uh, this is one of my favourite pieces to show you can also have a sense of humour. <laughs> he said the Greens, you know, don't have a sense of humour. Uh, and then, this, then at, here's an INS. This is one of the early pieces I got this, to persuading people to actually um, to make sure they were registered. So that was an important piece to get. And then, of course, we get the badges, the stickers, all those things. Uh, then th these sort of things started appearing. And um, it's sort of looking back at it, I go, well, anarchy is not the word for, for, for this campaign, for actually for most campaigns these days. Most campaigns that these days that are successful are very slick, are very well thought out, are, you know, have a hierarchy all those sort of things. So, um, so obviously for this campaign, it was to persuade people that it was the right thing to do and it wasn't going to affect them. So that seems to be the two big things that come through this. Um, and also, if you start looking at it, they're, they're actually saying how... They're actually using quite chosen images. It's, it's, it's without, you know, trying to put it down, it's nice people. Nice, clean, <laughs> respectable, inner-city people, uh, uh, you know, are the people whose, whose lives you're holding in your hand. So, so, of course, we've got a number of those. Then, of course, they realised they had to get to um, non-English speaking people. So, we collected a number of those things. This is the one in Hindi, in Arabic. And so, we've got a whole collection of those, which is good. And also, it's interesting to look at the imagery as well. Uh, and this is what I'll show briefly. This is a, a, um, a, an artistic piece. And uh, it, was, it was actually, I found it here tonight, in Inez, and it was done by an artist. Uh, sorry, I just lost his name. Uh, Tama T.K. Sharman, who's a New Zealand-born uh, uh, Melbourne artist. Um, and so that was a piece he made. Um, it's actually funny, I, I was reading about it, and, and there's a lot of uh, debate going on within the movement about what face we should, we should show. And it seemed to be about not pinning, p putting people off. So you don't see a lot of anger <laughs> or a lot of things like that in, in the material that's being produced. Of course, we had to collect some of the um, ubiquitous yes posters. So we have, of course, we have some of those, which you saw all around... Australia, and it also went to Melbourne Uni and I collected things like the stickers, the Socialist Alliance material, uh, who were very strong on this, um, and that's a promotion for the, the last rally, which is on the 26th of August 2017. Um, you also found, we also found some interesting sort of local council material, and uh, then we started getting into commercial material as well. This was produced by Gorman. Uh, it went very quickly, but I was lucky enough to write to them and they sent me one of their T-shirts and the sticker.
Uh, this is one of my favourite pieces. Um, it's a brooch I found was being produced in Tasmania, so I had to, to get one of those. And actually, we'll have that on display out there in the, when, at the end, the end of the show. Um, then, of course, there's more sort of um, less slick material. Uh, this was produced, to, again, to promote the rally on the 26th. And, uh, and at the rally, they gave people things like this uh, using the, you know, the, the famous pink triangle. Uh, now, as part of the exhibition we wanted to do at Immigration Museum, we decided to go to this rally and actually document it in photographs. Um, and, of course, very strong on signage, very strong on, on you know, the look people were presenting. Um, it's just some great signs too. So, as Beck knows, they're, they're, they're wonderful things to get. So, even if we can't get the actual things, we've got them in photographs. So, I love, that's one of my favourites. <laughs> Uh, it was good also to see some um, regional people there as well, because um, we're very strong now on not we're not just Melbourne Museum, we're actually the Museum of, muse, Museums of Victoria or Museums, a Museum of Victoria. So um, it, it was good to also get um, some regional stuff. But of course, it was about the people. So there's some wonderful shots of of, of those days as well. Um, now, uh, looking back, I actually am quite remiss in that actually we didn't collect a lot of, a lot of the no stuff. I put the call out, I tried to get people to keep it, but um, it just didn't make it into the collection so far. This is the one piece that I've got which I found abandoned on the train platform at Richmond Station. So, <laughs> um, so that, that's a wonderful thing, it was on the back. Um, so this is sort of stuff I'd like to try and find. So, um, you know, these collections are never um, closed, you know, there's always a chance to bring more stuff into it. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm hopeful some of this stuff's going to, to surface. I'm guessing not a lot of people in the audience will have this sort of material at home, but you never know. <laughs> um, it, it's funny, this is actually, I, I was looking back and this is, I remember this happening, this was an a, um, a incident in uh, one of the alleyways in Melbourne and uh, it turned out to, I think, to be a hoax. And we, I actually, we sent a photographer down there to try and take a photograph of it, but um, it wasn't there. So, um, yeah, it's interesting sort of things that happened during a campaign. Um, and... Yeah, and then, then of course it, w it appeared in the news, and it turned out that the Channel Ten had doctored the photo because there was this. Supposedly there was this big campaign, and it was just didn't happen. So yeah, it's interesting to look back and see the sort of things that happened during a campaign. Um, now the other thing, looking back, is you sort of think, wouldn't it be great if museums worked together more, libraries and those sort of things? We're all out there collecting, but we're not sort of coordinating what we do with each other. So um, I'm just looking back at some of the other stuff that's been collected. This is the, the, the uh, what, what was it, what was the powerhouse now, Museum of Arts and Applied Sciences and Sydney. Uh, this is the famous Love Bicycle, which was left outside Malcolm Turnbull's house. The feet are part of it, and it was now in the uh, National Museum of Australia. These are the shoes uh, Richard Di Natale wore uh, when the vote was passed in Parliament, and they're now in the Museum of Democracy. And this is the first couple married in Queensland, which is now in the Museum of Queensland, their outfits. So, yeah. Unfortunately, we haven't, haven't been offered a wedding yet, but uh, I live in hope. Um, so, of course, Australia did say yes, so that was a wonderful thing to celebrate. There's the numbers, and there's the, the announcement. Um, uh, but how we decided to commemorate it with an exhibition um, at the Immigration Museum um, called Save the Date, which was, and we actually were very optimistic, we actually decided to open it on the day of the announcement. And we're thinking that it was going to be passed, and it was. So what we did, we, we photographed a number of um, uh, I did, uh, couples, singles, all sorts of people that would have been affected by the vote. So, uh, we, so we had this exhibition up to over, over Christmas into the new year. And um, this is, of course, Janet Rice and her partner, who unfortunately passed away this year. Um, and so at the moment, these aren't actually in the state collection, but I will be working on to put them into the state collection. So we have this record of, of the debate and, and, the, and more importantly the people's lives that are affected. Um, one of the interesting th reactions we got to that second exhibition was from this couple, couple Lester and Vern. Um, Lester actually wrote to us and said, you know, how he, he was born in India, he thought he'd never see a time where he could be married. And so he's, he's lived in this, lives in Australia and now he can actually marry his partner. So they wrote, he wrote to us and said that was wonderful. And at the time my colleague Moya McFadden, which is sitting, sitting back there, she was working on an exhibition called Love, and of course she wanted to re represent all sorts of love. So she decided to contact Vern and, and Lester, and their story got told in the Love exhibition. So that was wonderful. So just amazing, these sort of things that can happen just out of, out of collecting something, having an exhibition, and suddenly uh, 
new contacts are made. Um, now, I just, this, this, this is a bit of a flashback for me. Um, I grew up in Tasmania in the 80s where um, I was actually an, a, you know, doing illegal acts all the time. <laughs> and when I was working at the museum there, one of the things I, I collected was... Uh, uh, I, did, I have a bit of obsession with Neighbours, <laughs> uh, but it was, it's just Charlene's wedding dress, you know, Kylie Minogue from Neighbours. So, um, so, it, so that was Neighbours 1988, uh, sorry, 87. And uh, so now i am actually been looking at, at working with, on Neighbours again, which is coming up to its 35th birthday. But Neighbours has certainly changed a lot. And of course, they had the first gay wedding on Australian television and uh, with Georgie Stone, the first transgender character and transgender actor. <laughs> So I'm actually going to be working with um, Fremantle Television to actually document these important things. And it's always interesting to see how popular culture uh, pre presents these sort of things. Um, this is the final piece I've got to show you. Um, and that is actually reminding us that, you know, we might come and document a protest march, a protest movement, but it's never over. And uh, this, was, this was an interesting fly that was reminding us, even if, you know, we, 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 get, we get marriage equality, lots of other people still haven't got equality. So, and, uh, and when you're thinking particularly about gender, sexuality, you know, all that sort of thing, um, transgenderism, all that sort of thing, uh, they're still happening. So um, I'll, I'll actually interesting to be working on those sort of movements and seeing how we can document them and talk about them in the museum. And I think that's everything. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. That was so good. Um, so I'm not sure exactly when, but around September last year, I started to see snippets across social media, um, my in friend's Instagram feeds, particularly on Twitter, um, about a girl in Sweden striking to raise awareness about climate change. It seemed to me, at least, that interest spread very quickly. And before I knew it, in November of last year, my son, who was 10 at the time, was talking about striking. I went along. Just to check it out, um, as Michael's described and Kim, we are always looking for um, contemporary expressions of culture to document within the collection here, your state heritage collection. Um, but I quickly realised how serious and organised these extraordinary, smart, independent young people were and that I really needed to take this seriously. Um, I have since, along with everyone else in the world, discovered a whole lot about Greta Thunberg. Um, it seems unreal to me that all this only started on the 20th of August last year, um, which is when she commenced her daily strikes. Um, and they were daily at the time, up until September 9th, when they became the Friday strikes that we all know about now. Um, by this time, a handful of students in the Netherlands were also striking daily outside of The Hague in solidar solidarity, and shortly that was followed by Berlin and Canada and other places. By late September, around the time that I started noticing this in my social media feed, kind of on the periphery, um, all of these places had moved to Friday strikes. And on November 1st, a small group of students from Castlemaine went on strike outside the offices of the Nationals and Labor MPs in Bendigo. And like I said, some of those students are here with us tonight. The next day they came back and they brought more students and the media coverage that followed fueled interest. And by the end of the month, Thousands of Australian students attended the first national strike, the one that woke me up that I described before. I think it woke a lot of people up. There have been countless political rallies over the years and we have many of those represented in our protest collection. But I felt the significance like electricity walking around this rally. These students got the urgency in a way that mainstream culture did not. Um, so I started collecting um, the very local response to this global call to action. Um, 
we have material from all the strikes so far, um, including the precursor strike in Bendigo and uh, the students tonight have brought some more material that I think they're gonna give to us later during Q&A. Um, and so I thought tonight I could just take you through some of the acquisitions that have made it through so far. But before I start, this looks like um, a, a completely warm allied crowd, but um, that's not always the case with this material. So I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of things up front that are not up for negotiation. Climate change is real and it is an environmental, economic and cultural crisis. Also, museum neutrality is a myth. As a collective of experts in science, history, technology, and first people's knowledge, our research, expertise, and work reminds us daily of these facts. Okay, onto the collection. So, meet Olive and Sophie, who are here up the back. Hi, Olive and Sophie, thanks so much for coming tonight. This particular sign was made by two 10-year-old students from Kingsville Primary. And it illustrates um, beautifully what I saw everywhere that day, which is how students incorporated their worldview into framing their response to the protest. Um, it's also interesting that these two chose to make their poster together and then convinced their parents to take them to the strike. Um, aside from the intense cuteness of this thing, um, I included this poster because it illustrates the intergenerational nature of the experience for very young participants, and my son was one of those, where um, these young people had very strong opinions, my son being one of them, but they weren't in a position to get themselves there. They had to negotiate that with their parents, and that's where the learning has come, this kind of bleed up, if you will. Um, and watch this space, because I'm very interested to interview these two young ladies. Um, this next poster, this is Victoria. Um, Victoria's Stop Adani um, poster um, was also from that March strike um, earlier this year. The theme was one of the most popular at that protest that I witnessed. Um, we took a film crew and uh, other curators uh, tended with me to help me. It was just so many people. It was quite a difficult task. Um, but reviewing the footage when I came back, the Stop Adani material at the March um, strike reached a peak. And if you think of the time that that was, um, it was just before the election um, and the students had very clear objectives. I have witnessed this at all of the marches, very clear objectives. And at this, it was no new coal, oil or gas projects, 100% renewable energy generation and exports by 2030, um, and funding for a just transition and job creation for all fossil fuel industry workers and communities. Like clearly, Adani was very central to the campaign. And everything was so well articulated, I can't stress that enough. Um, something that I can't um, present tonight because there are always gaps in the collection. Michael talked about some of his. Um, a big one for me was um, particularly from March, but I believe this has continued. Um, the Pacific Climate Warrior Group um, had an amazing combined response and I witnessed um, these beautiful uh, woven grass mats that had Stop Adani painted on them and they were as tall as the students and as wide as five or six students. And look, material like that um, needs to be represented. Um, the participation, uh, particularly um, that intersection within the protest, but I'm yet to collect anything around that. Um, this is Peter. Is Peter here with us tonight? Um, she was hoping to come. Ah, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Peter was the first um, ally protester that I met at the protests, um, not a student. Uh, Peter had never protested before, um, but told me that she was moved by the action of these young people and everything that she'd seen on social media with them talking and agitating. So she had chosen to take the day off work as a postie and represent. Um, I love this placard. 
it is, apart from the icy poles, this is my favourite placard. Um, it illustrates the great humour and flair and creativity that we saw and continue to see in protest, well, throughout time, but these protests particularly. Um, this one tapped into a really pertinent political moment in the debate. Um, it references then treasurer Scott Morrison bringing a piece of coal into parliament I think we all probably remember it um, claiming that it was nothing to be afraid of um, he was claiming coal, uh, coal as an important part of a sustainable and more certain energy future this happened um, about a month before this strike and from the number of po posters that I witnessed and that we've documented in the film um, the number of posters that had lumps of coal on them, I would say that it backfired on him really. Uh, the next one, this is another great one. This is Minna Baxter. Minna uh, was on strike from Northcote High School and she, she's in year 10, well she was, sorry, in year 10 at the time. Um, and I particularly, I liked the backstory, which is why I collected this one. I think also for Victoria, the representation of the coal fired, the coal fired plant is um, it's particularly pertinent for Victoria but um, we were offered so many more posters than we could possibly acquire I walked around each of the the rally the strikes with business cards and forms and just handed them out to the posters that I thought had potential I tried to engage um, the makers and holders of the banners in conversation about who had made it uh, we were trying to be very respectful knowing that we were dealing with a lot of underage people so I tried to take s photos of people with uh, of um, protesters who were 16 or above with their permission and people students who were there without their parents I took photos of them and rang their parents on the spot <laughs> or if they were with parents I got their permission on the spot um, and then I waited for them to get back to me because I wanted people to have some time to consider whether they really wanted to donate their posters. Um, and some people are still contacting me, but we, the response was extraordinary. Um, but I had to make decisions about what we co collected. Uh, we have, we are very short on space <laughs> uh, and we, um, have a committee that makes decisions and you have to really articulate your reasons for acquiring this one I collected because Mina had been selected for the Alpine Leadership School Program the year before the protests, which is um, public schools can put forward students they believe who have potential as leaders. And Mina had been selected and they go and live in this Alpine. Um, I've actually done some work up there on other um, on other projects and it's an extraordinary place they live and work in the alpine region they learn about ecology they learn about um, public speaking and this had had a profound effect on her um, she also was really aware of being an urban person who had now been exposed to uh, a country environment and her mind had been open to all of these ideas and she said it raised her awareness of the environment firsthand and said that it had compelled her to act and rethink our impact on the, um, on the planet. This is another intergenerational response. This is Lexa Becker, um, another very young participant and an example of that intergenerational experience. Mina was there with her mother and another sibling. I can't remember if it was a brother or sister. Um, and look, with the vast number of um, donation offers, I probably wouldn't have collected this one, except I have to shout out to Seraphim on Twitter, who at the time um, alerted me to the fact that the artist for this is a local street artist by the name of Phoenix. And I did then notice when I went back over the footage that this image was used by a lot of people and they kind of personalised it by colouring it in or doing whatever. And a few curators had commented as we the donations started coming in, they were like, oh, that looks a little bit like maybe the parents did that one. <laughs> but in fact, it is the street artist who created images for use by everyone in the marches. So it's a really interesting example. 
And now we come to the Castlemaine crew that I was talking about. Um, so the first strikers from Castlemaine that I mentioned at the beginning, um, from those students, we're getting the earrings um, that um, Milu made. Um, she's wearing them tonight and she's going to hand them over before she leaves. Thank you, Milu. Um, and she also wore those earrings in, I've now noticed, since you said that we could have them. She's worn them in media everywhere. You've done a lot of media. Um, it's extraordinary just how much coverage um, the strikes have gotten because of the work that you've done. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, we also are acquiring the bear. I think it's a beautiful, innocent, um, lovely expression of protest. And Callum is one of the students that joined that first Bendigo um, protest, the precursor to the bigger ones. Um, and we all, I'm also hoping to get permission for the very large banner. This is beautiful. Um, I'm just putting it out there to those who might be at the acquisition committee next month. Yeah, it's large. Um, I'm really hoping to get permission. Um, this banner, the reason, let me make my case, the reason that I'd like this banner is this was made by the students in the mall at Bendigo during the protest. Am I right? Yes, see, proof. And, and they came back the next day. It brought more students. And this was the original media campaign. This national response was born in regional Victoria. Pardon me, regional Victoria. I'm a bit excited. Um, also, there's a little um, thing down the bottom corner here that says, um, uh, no more coal, Adani is worse than Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and there's, there are just so many layers, so many individual stories when you start unpicking this. The student who wrote that was in grade five. Grade five. She's since gone on to start a organisation, is that what that is? A collective who are raising funds to plant a million trees, is that it? A million trees. You know, this is a grade fiver who 12 months ago, I don't know what she was doing, but right now she's campaigning for a greener planet. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that I can get that one through. I don't know, it's pretty big. Um, and then there's the one that got away. Um, like Michael with the no campaign, um, the very first, I haven't got a picture of it, I can't believe I haven't, but um, the very first protest Harriet made on the back of a Stop Adani plaque, uh, printed uh, poster, she wrote really simply in texter, uh, make coal history. And that has shown up in all the coverage from those first protests over and over again. And it, for me, it just resonated with uh, Greta Thunberg's very simple first protest of just a simple white piece of paper which stated strike, uh, school strike for climate. Um, and we have evolved and all the students have evolved and protesters have evolved to these ex beautiful expressions of protest posters that we've acquired. But I love that it started with this very simple, very honest plea. Um, so yeah, that's the one that got away. I'm also documenting in supplementary files the extraordinary vitriol and anger that has been stirred up, um, particularly aimed at Greta Thunberg, but also at many of the, the students here. Um, and I'm obviously looking for very Victorian responses to this national um, uh, campaign. Something this has raised and it's been raised um, a lot in the last 10 years for all of us, I think, is how we document and collect digital ephemera. Um, and I'm looking at collection managers with, you know, hope in my heart that we, we will get to a point where we have a, a, a consolidated response. We just don't have it at the moment. We are still material culturalists. Um, I'm doing screen grabs where I can and, you know, because some campaign, uh, sorry, some accounts get deleted. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I am trying to document as much of that as I can. I'm also trying to document the, um, the ways people have shown their support and sol solidarity with the movement. Um, and I'm in the process of acquiring these earrings. Um, 
by Christy down the front. House of Dizzy um, created these beautiful earrings um, which you can purchase to support um, the, uh, the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, the Adani ones. They're kind of like the blingy version of um, Milo's homemade ones and I think that's a really nice counterpoint as well. Um, but then also the Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network Water for Life earrings. They are so beautiful and I came to both of these um, through a friend wearing the earrings. Like I, I actually wasn't aware of them. Right, so to my last poster. Um, so all of this collecting took place before the extraordinary numbers that we saw on September 20. These were all protests prior to that one. I haven't really collected anything from there. However, one of our protest signs, this one, made it to that rally and was also at each of the ones before. So I'm going to close by sharing the first poster that I actually acquired, but the last that I've received, um, if that makes sense. Um, Annabelle uh, approached us the day after the first national strike with an accompanying statement that made us take note. I hadn't met her that day. She did this off her own bat. She contacted the museum and said, you need to be collecting this. This is important. Here, I've one, prepared one for you earlier. <laughs> her statement reads, I'm afraid that Earth, our beautifully diverse and wondrous planet, will be subjected to mass extinctions and climate change by the apathy of people in power. I hope that we can together move forward and make the necessary changes to halt climate change and save our planet. I dream of the Great Barrier Reef, the Amazon rainforest and the Arctic Circle. And I dream of them being just as vibrant for future generations as they were before global warming. Museum Victoria is proud to be documenting the climate strike movement. We are guided by values that encourage discussion and action around big contemporary issues and there is nothing as pressing as this. Our scientific staff work tirelessly to research and understand the natural world and fight for its protection. Our historic collections are riddled with extinct species showing us what we have already lost. We also acknowledge that Aboriginal people have self safeguarded this land for more than 60,000 years and we have a responsibility to that legacy. This material now sits alongside other major historic protest movements that have shaped our world for the better, just as this will. Thank you. So, for this last little bit of the night, um, probably the most exciting bit, I think, um, I'm going to run a little bit of a Q&A, more of a qu just more of a conversation, really. Um, but to start with, I'd like to invite our curators back onto the stage, Michael Reason and Kimberly Moulton, if you could come up and take a, take a seat. And then I'd like to introduce... Um, it's such an honour to have you here tonight, Christy. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome to the stage Wurundjeri woman, House of Dizzy owner, Christy Dickinson. As you've seen, Christy brings social issues to the forefront in her deadly jewellery designs and her work features in each of um, the areas that we've been collecting in tonight. Um, Michael didn't show them tonight because I know he was a bit pressed for time, but that Christy did some great stuff um, around that campaign as well. Um, and finally, can you also join me in welcoming to the stage, all the way from Castlemaine, Harriet O'Shea and Milu Albrecht. Nash Come up, thank you. Whose protest in Bendigo last year built into the November 30 national action. You may recognise them, like I said, from the massive amount of media attention that they've been getting, but ultimately they're, um, they're here tonight to um, represent the protesters. Thank you. No chair for me, so I'm going to stay up here, you know, like the queen of the world. Um, <laughs> I've got a stool though. Um, so I'm going to start. I think there's microphones on the chair for everybody. You might want to turn them on. Um, I'll see. 
Yeah, we'll see how this goes. I don't know, I feel like a school teacher over here. Um, I'm going to ask the same question to everyone, but I suppose I'll pose it to you first, Christy. Um, your style naturally and playfully addresses political, indigenous, environmental and feminist issues all the time. So I'd like to start off by asking you, and then each in turn, maybe you could think about, um, what does protest mean to you? Like, Oh, well, protest, oh, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, protest to me is just, um, yeah, giving someone a voice and showing like, um, yeah, what they believe in and just um, being like a force to reckon with and, you know, coming together with a like-minded set of group and, yeah, and sort of... It seems to come really naturally in your work. Yeah. Well, I mean, I love to, you know, give... I call my um, earrings conversation starters, so I really love to start a conversation wherever I go, say in a supermarket or the line in the bank. Um, and, I mean, the best way, to, I think, to, you know, protest is... Um, using fashion, I think that comes, you know, you see something emblazoned on a t-shirt or a jacket, but I do it in earrings, yeah. <laughs> and Milu and Harriet, um, maybe one of you could decide to who's going to field it, but clearly protest is important for you. What what does it mean? Um, well, for me, I, well, I think there's a quote um, that sums up um, protest for me. It's actually by Professor Dumbledore from Harry Potter. <laughs> um, yes. But he says, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Um, and to me, that's what protest is all about. It's about our collective voice over our voice as individuals. Because as an individual, as a child with you know no say in the political system, I always felt like I couldn't make a difference or a change. And that's what stopped me from acting earlier. But it's the realisation that even though my individual voice is weak, our collective voice is so strong and powerful and it can make a massive difference. Um, and it's all, yeah, it's all about working together um, and bringing our voices together to bring in all our different backstories and, you know, ways of life, our cultures and ethnicities, like, oh, you know, diversity and bringing that together with this one collective interest um, of action. And, yeah, that's what <laughs> protest is all about for me. It's terrific. Thank you. Um, do you want to say something? Um, wow. Uh, for me, I think protest is the the creative and like effort you put into and the passion that you put into something, and the the feeling you get when you when you do that. And I think that's just in itself is something to protest. Beautiful. So Kim, I know you're, you know, you have really here in all your work always represented um, strong opinions um, and that can often look on the outside like protesting and resistance constantly and I know it can become wearing and can you talk a little bit about what that's like Particularly in an organisation, you know, we've talked about this before, how um, resistance or protest for you is just kind of you wear it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, just going back to, to why I put that photo of Uncle William up there, that actually sits at my desk um, every day. And coming from a family of, you know, strong protesters and, and leaders and it's actually a responsibility that I have that I'm born into... Um, and I think that's sort of a part of my work here. I was, I was actually talking to a community member today who came in and I said, you know, my role here is a conduit for you and for, for the community that I come from. Um, and so, yes, it, it can be quite wearing, um, you know, when you're going into histories like really heavy colonial histories, like I, I briefly mentioned before, um, or talking about racism and prejudice, you know, in today's society or trying to break down what's even happening in our own institution. Um, you know, it's kind of a lived thing. I don't just leave it at the door um, and go home. It's, it's 24 hours a day. Um, but in saying that, you know, it's also a passion um, of mine and it's um, also important. And I think that's a lot of, you know, 
all of us, we have these conversations um, as curators and people working in museums. Why, why we're here is often because we're so passionate about um, what we're trying to achieve as well. And I think change and, you know, we're talking about in terms of unity and, and creativity um, and, and leadership, you know, from people like yourself in the community, Christy, you know, as a, a strong um, Wiradjuri woman. And, and th they are conversation starters as well. Um, and, and having having these conversations is r really important. And I think, Beck, what you said about, you know, neutrality and, and museums and, and that it's not a neutral space. Um, and having these conversations is really important. Yeah. yeah. Michael, I know you, um, Michael has a, per so he, Michael is um, curator of leisure and uh, Social, space. Social spaces. Um, he also looks after the um, fashion collections here a lot and has done some fabulous exhibitions. But he has a personal collection as well. And I know he has this mantra that is, it feels like protest to me. It feels like resistance. The idea of uh, your idea about identity being expressed through fashion. Maybe you could talk us through that as a and, way into And I was lucky enough in my last exhibition, Fashion Redux, which we had designers come in to... Um, react to items in our collection, to repurpose them, that sort of thing. And I was very lucky to work with Christy on that. And she made a beautiful suite of, of jewellery in, in sort of reaction to uh, Jenny Bannister dress in sort of that sort of 80s Australiana. And also a necklace which Jenny made, which was made in Australia. Yep. Um, and uh, I know Je um, you got to meet Jenny and uh, <laughs> had some That's interesting fabulous. times. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah, and, we, and uh, she made this suite of jewellery and we actually acquired it and you'll actually be able to see pieces from it on display today, including those amazing earrings, which I think yeah. we had to put under lock and key. <laughs> I was afraid they were going to disappear. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, 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 think, I, I think a protest can be, and uh, as um, Christy was alluding to, can be done through anything. Um, if you say to a lot of people protest, they think, oh, loud marches on the street, mm -hmm. screaming, that sort of thing, where it can be subversive, it can be quiet. Um, I think I mentioned growing up in Tasmania where, you know, as a gay man in the 80s, uh, everything I did was um, uh, quiet and all that, but, you know, I was breaking the law all the time. And uh, actually I worked at the, this is a little story, I worked at the police credit union in, in Hobart at the time. And um, so I couldn't, and in those days we had, uh, there was protests at the Salamanca market um, sort of pushing forward about reform in the law. And uh, as a sort of a 22 year old, man working there, I thought I couldn't really appear at these protests, but what I did was actually, I, we, we, we needed a bank account for our organisation, so I actually opened it up at the credit union and told them, you know, my boss that it was a social club, so. <laughs> <laughs> so here were all the checks for this, you know, gay organisation going out on with the police credit union. <laughs> it was actually called Gusto, which was the gay uni students of Tasmania organisation, which is where it started. So that was my, that was my protest, that was my subversive act, and I felt really proud of that. Um, I'm really interested um, in at this kind of hint at intersectionality that cli this cl climate strikes do seem to cut across everything. Um, feminism, uh, identity politics, um, it, it is for whatever you are, whatever your political banner is, um, climate change impacts on all of us. And I'm really interested to hear from um, Milo and Harriet how, because we're not intimately um, involved in the planning, you know, we're not there when you guys are all um, making decisions about how the strikes happen um, and how the action will work. Um, how's that, is it even in the room? Is it a discussion, Is it, or is it just that by the time your generation comes around, everything's considered all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, wait, sorry. So Could I'm thinking just... what I'm talking about, into, so I mean, you know, um, the the Pacific climate warriors that I see and there um, there's a queer uh, student collective that was active at the marches. Um, there was a Koori Voices group. You know, there's all these uh, little kind of um, sub-identity groups that all seem to have been given real space within the organisation of the climate strikes. And I'm wondering how conscious the... I mean, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering yeah. <laughs> how it comes up. Does it come up or is everyone just 
advocating for themselves strongly and it comes across democratically. Yeah, um, it's actually, <laughs> it's a really sort of uh, interesting mixture of just coincidence and then also intention. Um, it definitely started off, I think, as a bit of a coincidence because I think the thing that separates climate change from other um, other social movements is that it really does affect everyone and to massively varying extents, of course, but it will, it will affect you no matter what. Um, and so it's so important that we have a really diverse range of people um, who can represent you know, the different ways that they are affected by climate change. So I think that it started off as, you know, a bit of a coincidence. It just sort of happened because all these different people from different, you know, different communities um, and with different stories uh, were, were all impacted by climate change, so they all wanted to be involved. But um, through, you know, the whole this whole process, it has been really important that we that we we make sure that that continues to grow and we encourage that um, because it's really essential to our movement and especially with like Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders, it's really important that um, their you know their interests and their voices are amplified amplified and put forward um, because you know they have really valuable opinions and perspectives and obviously a really beautiful connection with nature that our culture doesn't it doesn't have in that in that same way and it's really important that we can you know collaborate with all these different people um, because with a with an issue as big as climate change we can't just have one solution we need you know so many different solutions and different people involved with different innovative and creative ideas so yeah yeah absolutely hey i think i'm going to open it up for questions um because time's kind of slipped away um i'm wondering if kate or uh, somebody could take a mic I'm just going to take one of these and share the love around I guess this is mostly for the curators. Uh, how do you collect photographs? So you've talked about sort of more wanting to collect more contemporary um, materials. How would you take photographs into your collection? Uh, Depends. You, historic or? Well, oh, say of the climate strike. Um, you'd take a photographer. <laughs> To, that's the easiest easiest way. We actually have museum very talented museum photographers. Um, the, with mine, the um, the equality rally and the also the portraits were all taken by uh, Rob Cigarro, who's on staff, a very talented photographer. And of course, then we don't have to worry about copyright and all yes. those sort of things. And I use um, Stephen Dixon for all the climate work. Um, look, if there was a killer image that came up that filled a need, we would acquire a digital image. For sure, we do often. Um, but as Michael said, like this material is so rich, one would think it is perfect for exhibition and display. And so you want to know that you can display it. We're a cultural organisation. We don't have endless pools of money, quite the opposite. And so to pay an age photographer the, for the rights to use an image would just kill a show. So we do have to think about these things while we're collecting. There's also ways like donations happen as well, but like for Haley's image, for instance, like that's that's a, a, a print of a, a run as an artist, contemporary artist that she's made. So we're acquiring the actual physical image in that case, um, and obviously the, the rights and everything sit with her. But we'll be able to display that image. Um, and we've I've, we've just recently had a large donation from Uncle Jim Berg, um, who's a, a community member of images um, like little folders of, you know, images from the 90s and that kind of thing that we'll have to um, digitise and work through with him. So there's different ways in that. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions? There's one up the back there, Kate. And I think, were you also wanting to ask a question? No. Yes. And another one here. It's for the live streamers to be able to hear it. Oh, OK. Um, for this is for the curators again. Um, are you guys collecting stuff with all the Royal Commissions and stuff that's been happening in the last, I guess, five years in Victoria? Which um, Royal Commission? Oh, because some we have. Child abuse, mental health. Yeah. Um, um, what's happening in that space? Because I guess that's been a new wave and a new awakening 
yeah. people getting awoke into what's happened in Victoria. It's a really, it's a really good point. You yeah. know, I'm not aware of anything around um, the child abuse. Well, one. I think that's massive because, yeah. like, it's yeah, been institutionalised from the from. Colonization, There's I an guess, entire you know, collection, actually, it's not mine, but Moya is here. There is an entire collection around um, the unaccompanied children. Which mm, that's the collection. Yeah. Um, and there's, uh, uh, which kind of strays into that area. But no, it's yeah. point taken, I, a I really guess, I guess rich I've got area. Four kids, and if I want to bring them to the museum and teach them about Victoria, yeah. teach them about Australia. Yeah. You know, I went to Fremantle and I look at their museums and they got history and it's like, what are we doing here in Victoria? Yeah, at the it's moment? great. So. The Royal Commission around the bushfires, um, t we did touch on because we um, post the Victorian bushfires, the Black Saturday bushfires. We developed a Victorian bushfire collection in response and so the that Royal Commission has been somewhat documented. But, um, yeah, I take that on point. Does anyone else know anything around those? Um, oh, I was just going to say thank you um, for your point. Yeah. It's really important. And um, in the First Peoples exhibition um, that's in Bunjalaka in the Aboriginal Cultural Centre, we do, um, through, through Communities Voice and community sharing their stories, um, go into a little bit of that history at different points. Um, but, yeah, I think it's something that we should really consider. And we're just in the process of reconsidering our collection development plans, so thanks for raising it. Yeah, and I think the we're right going to be time. seeing more and more of that sort of collecting. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, as a curator, I look at the news and I, I, and I see things like on TV and I think that might be interesting, that might be interesting, but there's also a part of me that thinks, how am I going to approach these people yeah. and say I'd like to collect this or that? So, um, yeah, yeah I mean, there, there are challenges and, yeah. There is that... Um, we experienced that with the Victorian Bushfire Collection as well, people who were um, clearly experiencing trauma. Um, so, you know, there's a, a duty of care in how we even think about approaching a project like that. But, yeah, great point. Yeah. 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 Well, we're all taking it on notice. Thank you. Is there any other questions? I reckon we. Ah, oh, we've got two here. And they might be the last two, I think, to keep us on track. Um, this is for the curators. Um, what sort of uh, factors need to be taken into consideration when it comes to these um, protest ephemera and other objects in the collection um, that might be gifted from community members? Um, because you know, they may not have been designed to last over a period of, like, decades, centuries. Actually, most things aren't. And yeah. uh, particularly a lot of things like protest banners, which you, are pretty much a mixed media thing, which um, I know the uh, National Gallery are having a lot of issues with contemporary art. And, uh, of course, this, this is sort of really is like contemporary art and, as I said, was very ephemeral. So, yeah, there were, that's something we have to think about, I think. And I'm sure Beck did when she was looking at the placards Part of it was thinking, you know, what's the point of collecting it if it's going to be, you know, in a pile on the floor in, you know, five years' time? So, yeah, and I'm sure it's the same. And then sometimes we just say it's okay that it's going to degrade. It's part of its life. It's part of its story. It's kind of part of our culture, isn't it? You know, the use of plastics. And um, I think with new, like, new technology now, like, we'll acquire a piece into the collection. So my methodology, which I know is similar to... A lot of my peers is that anything that's acquired now into the collection, we take photos, we digitise it, we have it on collections online. So it sits on these other platforms, where appropriate as well, of course, but um, sits on these other platforms in, per in perpetuity. Um, so if the physical object fades away in another 100 years, um, I also still there. really like the idea of um, kind of livedness of an object. This 
poster from Annabelle, you know, she offered it up after the very first strike. But at the same time in talking to her, she was so passionate that she was like, but I still want to keep protesting with it. You know, like it's it was part of her protest. So I said, yeah, keep it. Go on. And so she did. She kept using it. And this last one, the big one on um, September 20, you can, um, I think you can see it. It's got a rip over here and another rip at the top. Sorry, paper conservators in the room. And um, and I was like, I spoke to her that day and I was like, how did it go? And she says, great, the post's got a few more ribs in it. And I was like, okay, walk to the museum now <laughs> and hand it over. And so we took it because, at, you know, if it's ripped in half, it's going to be hard to display. But I do like that idea of, um, we call it object activation sometimes. Wear and we tear, wear and tear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the last question. Hello. Um, my question is for Michael in particular, but I guess it could more broadly be for anyone. Um, so with the marriage equality vote, um, I think, I think generally there can be a tendency for, in retrospect, seeing social change as something that was uh, inevitable or deterministic, um, when it, it often isn't the case. And although it did go through with a clear majority, it was, I think, closer than a lot of us would care to admit. 60-40 is really not that much of a gap. Um, you mentioned that you had difficulty finding some of the um, campaigning for the no vote. And I guess, um, how do you think the museum is preparing to give a more accurate, reflective indication of what the social scene was at the time, rather than just a one-sided depiction of yeah, how absolutely, that's unfolded. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm still looking for material. Of course, a lot of it was documented in images, which is not quite the same as the actual objects. So I'm just hopeful, and I, I mean, like everyone else here, I'm working on about 20 different projects. So, but yeah, part of it is actually going back to older collections and trying to fill in gaps. Um, so yeah, yeah, it is a, you know it's a bit of you know, hoping that this stuff will turn up and and putting feelers out and that sort of thing. Um, I did actually find I had a had a collection of PDFs from one of the websites, um, so I might actually be looking at those, putting those into the collection, because a lot lot of the, a lot of electronic stuff is now in PDF form, so that's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, rather than just images, it would be great to try and find some of this stuff, and we do find stuff does actually appear over time. And particularly if someone's, and I found I found that the no people were a bit more reticent about you know oh the museum or that sort of thing. So I'm hoping over time, especially if people sort of change their opinion or whatever, and and that often happens, you know, something comes in and then suddenly the percentage of people who agree with it goes up. So um, it's yeah, it's still going to be lurking around in drawers and things. So I have, do have this hope that it will turn up. Well, on that note, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we had a lot more tickets sold for this, so I'm, I'm wondering why people aren't filling the seats. But thank you so much for coming. I really want to thank our student um, protesters coming all the way from Castlemaine. I'm just so grateful. And um, just before we leave, um, I'm wondering if you could hand over the special thing. <laughs>